Thank you, Thanks, Mark. Thank you to uh, Eric, Mark, and Lee for inviting me. Uh, it's always a great meeting, so thank you. And try and make this a little bit more interactive as we are suggested. So I'm going to try and speak quickly because we have a lot to get through with the other talks. We're going to go through an initial assessment, management considerations for patients, pre-cath diagnosis and imaging. I'm going to then use a case example to go through a lot of how to think your way through a case. Um, and as Eric once told me that if you're going to get up there and show your case, show me you're crazy. He swore I won't. Um, and make sure that you show the cool stuff so you can get, garner as many lessons as you possibly can. They'll go briefly about follow-up. Oh, sure. <laughs> or do you want to skip them in the interest of time? Well, no, no, let's do no, them. They're good. Come on. Where are these people going? Their flights tomorrow. They have all night. Next question. <laughs> mm. it's like watching a horse race. <laughs> Let's go next. See if your vote lasts, you have much less impact. <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right, so that's my follow up part of the talk. All right. Let's start, go back to the slides, please. All right, so here we go. So, of course, 6% of all patients with congenital heart disease, mean life expectancy in patients who are unrepaired, untreated, is 35 years. So we think about this as a simple lesion. We don't typically think of it as complex, but the outcomes really are very poor for those who have a significant coarctation. Anytime you see them in the clinic, they come to you in your consult going through a full assessment. Headaches, blurred vision, chest pain, exercise intolerance, anything in the history that's going to come out. And I'm not going to go through all of that here because this is a cath talk and we don't like to uh, talk much about history, right? But history and physical is incredibly important, making sure you meet your indications. So indications, patient with a blood pressure gradient of greater than or equal to 20 millimeters mercury by cuff between the upper and lower extremities. If you have a less than 20 millimeter mercury blood pressure gradient, do they have systemic hypertension? Is there significant LVH on echo? Significant hypertension or ECG changes with exercise. Is there decreased LV systolic function that you may be underestimating the true gradient? The other thing you may throw in there is with a significant large number of collaterals, you may not get a significant gradient. A huge collateral burden would also be an indication. I did not, that didn't make it to the last slide, sorry. So then management. Before you come and do this, you're going to need to do a full pre-cath diagnostic assessment preparation. Are there concerns about their coronaries? Do they need antihypertensive therapy to get them safely to the cath lab? Have they met the criteria for intervention? And then what approach is the most appropriate? So if you look at overall, I think that a lot of this is fairly simple. The stent par portion of this talk, greater than 25 kilos, some say 35, some say 15. In adults, stent placement is going to be your primary and stent placement is going to be there for recoarctation. Less than a year of age, you're going to refer to the surgeon. One year to 10 years, around 25 kilos, it's less um, clear what the right answer is, and as technologies continue to improve, lower profile, we're going to continue to likely go down the stent route more from a better long-term outcome. So we've all seen these echoes, diagnostic um, assessments, you get your nice 2D picture, your color picture, you see your anti-grade holodiastolic flow on your uh, aortic Doppler. I've now switched where when I was a fellow, we did a lot of echo and you get made, got your blood pressure graded and then you brought them to the cath lab to figure out the anatomy of the cohort. And cohorts can be very, very complex. Even though we consider them to be a simple congenital heart defect, there is significant variability. So doing MRI and or CT, depending on what imaging modality is best, whether you want to do anesthetic or not, to really understand the anatomy ahead of time. Because if you then look at the diversity of your arch and you do 3D reconstructions, 
you can have something that's relatively simple in the isthmus or any number of very complex unrepaired or post-operative conditions. And some of these images are from um, one of my partners, Alejandro, so thank you to him. So what do you do when you get to the cath lab? First, you have to think about where you're going to start, where are you going to go, which way are you going to approach. Retrograde is typically the approach that would be used. And then do you need to have additional monitoring or imaging from a prograde venous approach? If you have an ASD, do you want to just simply go around? Do you need a transeptal? Are you going to get radial artery um, access? You always need to clearly delineate the aortic arch and the head and neck vessel anatomy. You may do biplane angiography. You may do 3D rotational angiography. I've not typically done 3D rotational angiography, but certainly there are wonderful pictures that show this. And then when you get in, <clears throat> if it's simple, straightforward, sure. But most of them are not simple and straightforward. And you need to use creativity, different approaches, different equipment, and different co collaboration. So you're going to start with your baseline angiogram. I love this picture because it shows you some fantastic um, collateralization. So you go retrograde and you take a picture with a pigtail. Whether you do a transeptal and you can see the Mullen sheath here that's into the left atrium and a Berman, angiogram, a Berman angiographic catheter coming prograde. Or a picture in a patient who's coming from right radial artery access. And once you get in, you can do your 3D rotation, get a much better understanding of this patient who's had a prior interposition graft surgically from their left subclavian to their distal descending aorta. So then, what do you do when you're actually there? So I'm going to now go through a case that I did recently, which is a really crazy case that came up. 42-year-old man, and we'll go through it together. And I've got a couple times we're going to see what you guys think. Had a co repair in 1975. Anyone have any medical records that date back to 1975? No, neither did we. So we had no clue what this guy actually, oh yeah, fine. Lee knows his own medical record from 1975. Um, but we don't know what this guy had. Came back and had a re-repair in 1988 with an interposition graft from the left subclavian artery to the descending aorta. Had been hypertensive, otherwise well. Sitting on the toilet, you know, not always a safe thing to do. Um, Valsalva had acute chest pain and hemoptysis. Thankfully, he took him to the hospital, was admitted to the cardiothoracic ICU, which at that point in time meant he didn't see a cardiologist for a few days. And then I get a consult. Of course, it's 4.30 in the morning. He's been in the hospital now for four days. <laughs> Cardiac surgeon, oh, I'm about to do a transplant. I need your help. The, this guy, his crits falling, his sats are falling. Can you do anything percutaneously? Please do something percutaneously. Okay, I'm going to go scrub. If you need anything, call my resident. Here's his number. And that's literally how I woke up at 4.30 the day after I'd been on call doing the other case that I just showed you. So here's the baseline anatomy. They start with a CTA and you need to get a first start. So I'm going to let this run through a few times just so you can see it. Okay, so these are the key images from that CT. You've got a coartation here at the isthmus. You've got a dilated left subclavian artery. You've got the start and then into a pseudoaneurysm. And then you have your interposition graft that connects down to the descending aorta. Here's the 3D um, reconstruction from that CT, where again, you can see where it comes in and this blurred out thing in the top. So of course, this was done at another hospital. This contrast for this angio was entirely in the SVC and really helpful when we tried to do the reconstruction. So this is me using Osirix, um, which can be very helpful to understand best what you're trying to do. So what do you do? Balloon angioplasty, bare metal stent, cover stent, surgery or other? Show of hands, I don't do this with the thing. Who would do balloon angioplasty? All right, there goes the tumbleweed across the room. Bare metal stents? Covered stents? Surgery? Other, something I didn't think of? Okay. Now then you have to start thinking, what's your plan? Where are you gonna access? What wire? Where are you gonna go? What balloon? It was an aneurysm. Of the interposition graft. So based on the, on the, so right here where the green wire, green arrows come in, yeah. it looks like the interposition graft has dehissed away from the left subclavian and has formed a pseudoaneurysm. <laughs> For anyone at the back who didn't hear, Eric said that's not good. Okay, so we agree, that's not good. So what are you going to use? How are you going to get there? What wire? Where are you going to start? What balloon? What stent? What sheath? To pace or not to pace? Are you going to do additional imaging and 3D rotation? 
All right, so phone a friend. Anyone have any thoughts? Eric, what would you do? Can I see the picture again? Oh. Sorry. This better not cut out of my time. Just look at this. How would you approach all of this? Yeah, how much is it measured? Like, how much is it measured just like? The narrowest segment of the cohort? <laughs> so just pro so the yellow arrow measures a, the, the subclavian at that segment just before the. <laughs> So you want to deal with this? So what? Okay. Where do you? Where? Tell me yeah. where to stop. Uh, here, come here. I want to. So this is the subclavian, right? Yes. It comes off the subclavian, right? So right there is the subclavian. The subclavian actually. Yeah. I, I've, I've been over. This is the subclavian. So that's the subclavian going up. Yes. So maybe this is the graph, the beginning yes. of the graph of the pseudoiners. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I guess the question is now what to do at the, at the reconstruction resource sector. That is a very odd looking. Is there a place to land? You're not allowed to talk any time. You're going to pick yourself later. Is there a place to is there a place to land? I just figured out what I do. I think to be very honest, what you could do is you could go up, go up through the graft. I would go through the subclavian. I would go up. Through the through the jump graph, and I would try and put a covered stance and seal off whatever that bulge is, uh, landing you know a strut or two into the subclavian as it goes up, and, and accept that I'm going to be slightly off there. Okay, we're concerned we've dehissed away from the subclavian. Well, I, I know, but I mean, you have to cover that, right? Did you do it? Yeah. All right, so hang on. I have an order here, so that's Eric. Next, Zahid. What would you do? Who's Zahid sitting with? It's Frank King. I would go to the native site and send that. Okay, so you'd send the native card first. Zahid, what would you do? It'll take away options. The reason why I don't want to do that is because it's going to take Hey, okay, away. don't take away all my, my talk. It may take away options. Can you put the slide in <laughs> Which one? This one? Yeah, this one. This one is good. I would, I would stand the native uh, site and then occlude the jump graph completely. Okay, so. Let's get through this, and then so here's what we so here's the picture from the angio. That's uh, much nicer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I would <laughs> <look nice. laughs> like. So uh, yeah. the first thing we did was when we got in, we took a picture because we had a plan, we had a thought. The first thing I did was collaborate with the vascular surgeon. We went to the hybrid OR, and what you see here is we went percutaneous right femoral artery access, and that's the pigtail coming from below. Surgical cut down of the left axillary artery, and that's a wire in from the left subclavian down into the ascending aorta. Mm -hmm. We then attempted to seal the interposition graft completely off by going the other route, by d implanting a CP-covered stent from the left subclavian, from the left axillary axis. We were very concerned that the turn you would need to take from the aorta through the coarct up into the left subclavian was going to be too torturous and would be hard to get through with the stent. So we then put in, so it was a 14 French 30 centimeter bright tip sheath, an Amplat super stiff, the short taper sitting in the ascending aorta. We then put in a pigtail catheter retrograde so we could take angiograms and see where the arch was coming from. And we then put in the cover stand. So this picture here, again, each step, when the sheath went into the aorta, the sheath kinked. Every single time, right where the tip is because it went from being almost horizontal to almost vertical. So when the balloon comes in here, the balloon's already advanced and the stent has shifted backwards a little bit. So we then were worried because of that location here what we we're going to deal with. So oh, that didn't play, sorry. So we then inflated and as you can see with the inflation of the second balloon, the outer balloon, how much further in it is, was worried that it wasn't going to actually open. It ends up opening and what we then took is this picture here. 
And what you can see there is there was still a residual leak. So we then came in, took another picture, and wanted to make absolutely certain we didn't jail off the left vertebral artery, put in a second covered stent, telescoped within the first, had the same problem with the sheath kinking. This one, however, stayed where it was. And then this was our final angiogram of the left subclavian artery. And that's now open. You can see, though, where you are. You've not jailed into the aorta. You've sealed the subclavian completely. And you've now recreated the wall of the subclavian for this case. And you still have the coarct now to deal with and the interposition graft. <coughs> so what next? How about any other? Lee, now do you have any ideas? Well, I guess you want to deal with the coarct somehow. OK. Okay, so you're concerned that if you put the cover stand too high, you're going to obstruct the subclavian. Okay, so here's what, where we, for, and, and this is where we're at right now. So did you consider a bare metal stent or no? No. Okay. I, I would put the cover stent all the way, just uh, distant to the subclavian, just before the carotid, then puncture the covering from mm -hmm. where you're coming and open the spot. And okay, the so that was our backup plan. So that's one of the keys is you always have to have a backup or a bailout plan. We weren't sure how this subclavian was going to deal with first. The initial plan I is mean, I'm sitting you, there you, doing a case with the vascular surgeon scrubbed, the cardiac surgeon pacing at the foot of the table back and forth the entire time because we weren't certain what was going to happen. So our key was first seal the pseudoaneurysm so the hemoptysis stops, the bleeding stops, and the patient stabilizes. We, from there, we then had the opportunity to see what else there was. So we've now sealed that. We're now in a more stable place, and that's where we were at. So would you consider a bypass, a carotid subclavian bypass or anything like so that? We were, so we were considering a, all of these were options, that you could seal the left subclavian completely, and then you could do a carotid to left subclavian bypass. The fact that we had access from the left axilla, mm -hmm. if we sealed it completely, you can perforate through the side of a covered stent, open and fracture that opening so you aren't actually jailing it. And Nathan, you had another question or comment. Say, if you address the core, you're going to seal the pseudoaneurysm, right? I mean, even though it's stenotic, they're distal, you still have a, a theoretical way to do it from a descending aorta, retrograde. All right. Shh. So, you're 100% correct. No, correct. The vertebral is not jailed, but subclavian flap repairs were not done in 40-year-olds. 40-year-olds, as far as I'm aware, don't tolerate very well to having an acute removal of flow to their subclavian, although I don't know, so that still is possible. Three, three percent are symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, as long as you have, but if you're going to do that, you have to must make sure that you have a paper vertebral on the contralateral side. That's the thing that's important. So it's only three percent. Why do you have to have a patent vertebral, and why is not that... So basically what will happen is if you uh, lose the claim, you'll basically fill the arm through the vertebral right. arch through the break. But it's, but it's the, con the, imp <laughs> the ipsilateral <laughs> side. So as long as the vertebral on the ipsilateral. No, the vertebral's got to be open on the other oh, side. So the right yeah. vertebral. The right yeah. Well, if the circle of Willis is intact, as long as your carotids are open. Oh, this is, uh, it's the floor is about to sleep. Not have a All right. And some, some people are naturally dominant in one vertebral or the other, which is the other thing. That you can't just be open. There's, you have to make sure that it's not the non-dominant vertebral. Or you can just not seal it, and then you don't have to worry about any of this discussion. So that's what I did. So we end up using, instead, typically I've used an Amplatz super stiff wire, short taper, put it up into one of the subclavians distally, and use that. This, of course, we're in the vascular wire. They just pulled out their Lunderquist curve. So the Lunderquist actually comes in three different shapes. It's straight has a single curve, which is the aorta, or the double curve, which is the RVOT into the PA. So they just pulled out their single curve. It goes in, sits beautifully in the ascending aorta, gives you a nice curvature to the sheath. Attention to detail. The reason I'm going to put this here now, we've got the Mullins sheath up, we've got this. The wire's there from the <coughs> left axilla, 
And what you can't see, and neither could we, was the surgical resident exchanged the pigtail over the wire, pulled out the sheath, and when the surgeon on the right-hand side of the patient compared to the fellow or the resident, sorry, on the left-hand side of the patient, noticed he was standing in a pool of blood, two liters, two and a half liters of blood on the floor later, they realized they pulled the sheath out of the left axilla unintentionally. Mm -hmm. So back to basics, mm -hmm. you need Let to... Let the surgeon, surgical resident, touch a piece of equipment? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. So I, they can hold the wire until I see that it's in the wrong place. Then I will take the wire from them. But so the, the pigtail went in. I didn't know who was who at that point. I thought it was a fellow. Regardless, <laughs> back to basics. Sheet, you know, you can't cath without access, and you need to make sure your sheets are not coming out and you're bleeding all over the place. Patient, thankfully, was stable, got a transfusion, and was managed well by the anesthesia team, but. No matter, like, all the crazy of all of this, the reason this patient almost didn't make it was because the sheath came out, right? So, keeping things into perspective. You don't sew the sheath then? Mm. Not when you have to move it back and forth to deploy stents and whatnot. Oh. Okay. So, this is the first covered stent going in from below. I feel like mm. On the inner balloon, what you couldn't see was how much it moved down, but I was trying to avoid jailing the left subclavian completely. So this was now another CP stent. Put a second one inside the first. Now we're willing to go up a little higher and we figured if worst case scenario, if we're not fully occluding, we can go up around it and curve the softer platinum stent around the arch and open up into the subclavian if we have to. Right, to open it that way. So this time it opened really beautifully. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous result. So this now is a Vita balloon, 18 atmosphere. And so this initially started off at about 5 millimeters. We've now taken up, you can watch this open with the 14 millimeter Vita balloon at 18 atmospheres it actually opens. You got absolutely no opening whatsoever with the lower pressure balloon and the bib and whatnot. But we elected not to go bigger than this. The gradient at this point was about 15 and we did not want to take it because I did not know where the Gore-Tex ended and I did not want to stretch beyond what the capacity was of a bare metal center with this aorta and sort of took that older approach before cover sense were available of open it and come back once you develop some scar tissue adhesions and whatever else to do it as a staged. So this is what it now looks like. We've opened up the left subclavian, we've sealed off the pseudoaneurysm, we've opened up the cohort, we have a 15 gradient, almost done, what next? What did you say, Nathan? Okay, so now, don't forget, you still have a pseudoaneurysm that could potentially be bleeding. With the coarct in place, it was at a very low pressure phenomenon. Now you have a much, much higher pressure feeding into this. So you can now really better appreciate where the interposition graft really doesn't look like it's coming off the subclavian, and the whole pseudoaneurysm is filling from that. The um, way that we dealt with this was putting in an amplast vascular plug 20 millimeters, put that through the sheath, Final gradient, 15, no residual pseudoaneurysm, no hemoptysis, recurrence, and the plan is to come back around three, six months later to complete the stent dilation. We recommended follow-up CT before going home, one month in pre-catheterization. So here's the follow-up CT at one month. You can see that the stents are open. It's actually one of the coolest pictures I've ever seen of an amplaster vascular plug here. We don't usually get this, but look how pretty this is on the CT. And you still have a bunch of tissue around it that needs to reabsorb, but this is now sealed off completely. And the 3D shows this is now opened. So the reason why we need to, that I would say is there's consult to completion, and I don't think there's ever a completion for coarcs. <laughs> Patients can get fractures of their stents, they can get pseudoaneurysms, they can have other complications, and they need to be managed by people who understand how to manage coarctation stenting, and they shouldn't just be discharged afterwards if you're not going to know how to manage it. So you need to have the consideration for intentional staging of your stent, and so this patient will come back for another cath, monitoring for, as I said, dissection, pseudoaneurysm, residual recurrence, gradients, blood pressure gradients, blood pressure control, and then whether you're using CT scans, which is typically the gold standard, for the covered stents, because of the platinum nature, you can use an MRI with the less artifact, and black blood imaging can show you very well inside the stent, and you may pick up pseudoaneurysms, but CT is typically your gold standard, and especially with the low-dose radiation that's now available, that's the key. The question I would ask the group is post-stent antiplatelet anticoagulation. I don't use it. I know that for the COAST and COAST-2 trials, we had to have them on aspirin. 
Um, now that the trial is done, I don't use anything. Does anyone use anticoagulation or antiplatelets after a coarct stent? Aspirin. So what do you use and for how long? Aspirin. Just aspirin? Yeah. Anything else? Anyone anticoagulates? It should be in the water, right? Is there anyone who's ever had a clot that's formed on their stent? Like, what's the impetus for doing the aspirin on the stent? They have enough vascular disease beyond even the Usually, that it's that's worth right. Just giving a Clark patient, patient an aspirin. It's not a big deal. It's just like they're. So you're doing it more for. Their arteries don't react. And yeah, put in a stent. You know, you know, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of them are hyper. A lot of them are hypertensive. Of course. No, I don't. If you look at that's why they go blood pressure even, even more <laughs> they're, they're 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 lower. They have systemic problems. They're not as reactive. And so I think the more you treat their risk factors early, like I'm even aggressive with, like, I'm, this is an international meeting, but like cholesterol at a younger age in the 30s, 40s, I will be more aggressive because you're, you're playing the 80 year game, right? Or 100 year game. How many patients oh. do you have yeah. with cord cases over 50 who have cord disease? All of them. Like really? I mean, we cath we cath we cath all our patients over forty with co even uh, younger. Actually, we cath all of them. We don't find a lot of coronary disease. It's true. There's a lot of more, lo lot more maple syrup. There's a lot more maple syrup. So, so we need to have aspirin in the water and maple syrup with every dessert. <laughs> So, yeah, that's all right, a good can question. I get every pediatric cardiologist to put your hands up? Who gives? And if you are a pediatric cardiologist with your hand up, keep your hand up if you continue aspirin after an aortic stent. If you do not give aspirin after a coarct stent, put your hand down. You confused wow. everyone. <laughs> you confused everyone. <laughs> so everyone. So every, double negative. <laughs> so every pediatric cardiologist with the, had your hand up. All of you would do aspirin after a coarct stent. Six months until it's endothelialized and stop. Yeah. <laughs> so the next the, the next slide is going to show you the data that supports aspirin use, which is none. All right. So all right. So just to finish off the talk, so follow-up imaging is important. You don't know what you're going to what. Yes, it is. Yeah. So the case here on the left is a patient who had a cohort stent put in. It wasn't long enough to put in a second stent. It probably caused a little perforation through. These are both covered stents on the left. And just because of the way the two interacted, um, developed a small pseudoaneurysm. And this was not into the cath lab because of the pseudoaneurysm. There was a, rec there was a new gradient that was noted. The one on the. Just go back. Do you see the catheter sticking through the lining? Mm -hmm. It just dropped across. Yeah. So this was a case that when I was a fellow, we did, and what you don't see are. here is this was a patient who had a bare metal stent. This is now three covered stents in. Once we figured out where it was, did the high pressure balloon got whatever calcium or spicules that were out of the way and stopped rupturing the, the Gore-Tex, used the different cor the, another covered stent, and four covered stents finally sealed this thing off. But unless you follow these up, you aren't going to know what you don't know, and that's why I don't think that the completion ever exists. All right, so key points. Thoroughly assess the anatomy prior to the catheterization. Have a plan in place before beginning. Always know what your backup and your bailout plan is because you're not sure how everything's going to respond. Consider access, equipment, and all personnel in advance. Collaboration for these cases is, you know, and creativity are both essential, and thorough follow-up is important, too. So, so thank you. I have one other key point. The case you show should not be your first case your third case, your 10th case, okay? You, you should not be doing that case uh, as your first case in the cath lab, you know what I mean? So I mean, 
pick the right cases to do. Like coarctations can be simple, they can be complicated, and you should know which, you should try to learn which ones you should get some backup for. Uh, and that takes with experience, right? So that would be my one teaching point. If you have a mentor or someone who's older than you who, who's familiar <laughs> with this type of stuff, Well, I'm not that much older case. than you, Mark, but I'm happy to be your mentor. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. This is like a free hand. Yeah. How come it's not coming in? Okay, there we go. You're you're doing the double negative thing again. Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> 